I think we are live and streaming. Um, thank you folks who are uh, joining us today. We really appreciate it. Um, so this is our fireside chat and I'll have everyone go around obviously and introduce themselves, but just to set up um, what we're gonna be talking about today, we're gonna keep it real casual, um, but really just want everyone, Paige and Justin, myself included to share experiences um, of what they've been up to this year as it relates to schools and universities within the Colleges That Change Lives group. And this kind of came about because we know that CTCL has a very student-centered mission, which is super related to the Unibody mission, but more importantly, um, something that we all value. And we were very curious to learn, how does that happen virtually? How do you build that belonging? How do you continue to stay student-centered through what has been a very chaotic year. Um, so I'm really interested to hear from you all folks. Feel, feel free to ask us any questions. Um, but Paige, um, we'll talk about our current CTCL partners, which we have quite a few and what they've done to continue to be student-centered. And then we'll have Justin um, talk about what him and his team have done as well. So I'll kick it off with the introduction. Uh, Brittany McFadden, I am a university partnership executive here at Unibuddy. That essentially means I talk to folks in admissions, marketing, recruitment, outreach all day, every day. Um, and I spend a lot of time on university websites and seeing how student friendly they actually are. Prior to joining Unibuddy, I worked mostly in the orientation welcome weekend um, kind of area at the new school, better known as Parsons here in the city, and prior to that, SUNY Purchase. Um, so excited to talk a little bit more about something that I know when I was working in orientation, and as I know folks in admissions know as well, the importance of that student belonging piece here today. And I'll kick it over to Paige. All righty, thanks, Britt. And like Britt said, my name is Paige, and I am a customer success manager here at Unibuddy. Uh, before coming to Unibuddy, I actually worked in higher education as well. Um, I worked at a large public institution, and then I also worked with Justin at Willamette University. Or university, geez, if I could say the word university, that'd be good start. Um, but it was a really great time for me to be able to kind of understand what Britt was talking about, the importance of really putting forward student-centered communication, and that's something that I really like to bring to all of the university partners that I work with here at Unibuddy as well. So I'll kick it over to Justin, and he can introduce himself now too. All right. Well, thank you, Paige and Britt. Um, my name is Justin Strohmeyer. I'm the Senior Associate Director of Admission at Willamette University. Um, Willamette is a proud member of Colleges That Change Lives. Uh, we're located in Salem, Oregon, which is the Oregon State Capitol. We have an undergraduate enrollment of about 1,800 students and a graduate enrollment of about 600. Um, so our College of Arts and Sciences, which houses all of our undergraduate majors, is supported by graduate programs in business, law, and theology. Um, we offer a lot of really innovative dual degree programs in conjunction with those professional schools. Um, and um, I think one of the, the most um, unique aspects of the student experience at Willamette is our connection with local government and, and policymakers um, over at the state capitol because we are closer to our capitol building um, than any other university in the country. And so uh, we have a lot of students that gravitate towards our programs in the social sciences, especially our politics, policy, law, and ethics degree. Um, and so we're really proud to see that level of civic engagement from our students um, and that, that drive to really um, leave a lasting legacy, which I think is really at the core of the, the Willamette mission and has been for almost 180 years. Uh, Willamette is the oldest university in the West. And so I think that that, that pioneering spirit is still very much alive and well with our, our current undergraduate students. Um, we offer Division Three athletics. Um, I'm just trying to kind of paint a picture of sort of uh, the, the scale and, and the, the students that we work with. Um, we find that um, uh, a lot of students from the West Coast um, make up our, our incoming class each year. Obviously, Oregon, Washington, and California are large feeders for us. Um, but I think due in large part to our affiliation with CTCL, we also, um, I would say have a much more national reach than some of the other small schools in the Pacific Northwest. And so we're really proud um, of the, the visibility and um, recognition that our affiliation with CTCL gives us um, to, to really generate interest from students in different markets around the country, as well as students um, across the world. Um, we have a really unique partnership with Tokyo International University, um, which has been in place for the last 50 years. And that brings a cohort of students 
from Tokyo International to study on our campus each year, typically about 100 students that come as a part of that cohort. Um, and I think that that really helps drive a, a real sense of um, sort, sort of cultural competency and global, um, just global perspective on our campus, which then in turn also attracts other degree-seeking international students. Um, so a lot of exciting stuff going on at Willamette. I'll be able, uh, excited to tell you more about it as, uh, as we go through today's session. I will say that's one of my favorite fun facts about Willamette is that you beat the University of Texas at Austin to be the closest university campus to a state capital by four blocks. <laughs> Real fun fact. Thing. I thought you were going to say that it's the oldest institution in the West, which I did not know that I learned that just now. So thank you. Um, uh, so let's kind of just start in, you know, in terms of, of context, we're at December 10th. Um, just a couple of more weeks left in this fall semester. Uh, Paige, I know you talked to a lot of our, our current partners. Um, what What's top of mind when you are speaking with, um, you know, folks at the different universities in terms of, you know, how they're planning to get through the rest of the fall and then also what their, you know, plans are for the spring? Yeah, so I think for a lot of our partner institutions right now, the big focus, especially for those who are on the Common App, is really making sure that students feel comfortable and confident with the application that they have submitted um, or are going to submit by the January 15th deadline, depending on you know when they want their students to actually apply by. Um, but I think that we've been seeing a lot of really kind of focused events around that. So putting your, um, counselors up in front of the students and saying like, hey, if you need a one-on-one -on -one appointment with me, or if you want to join this webinar where I walk through like a quote unquote, well done application, you know, these types of things are really useful at this point of the funnel. Um, and then looking into yield too, I mean, I think we're all very aware at this point that 2021 is not going to change the kind of remote landscape that we're all in. So as much as possible, recognizing that those virtual events that you have been taking part in during the fall are likely going to extend into the spring. So potentially offering smaller on-campus events, but also really beefing up that virtual um, opportunity for your students to making sure that they feel like they have a place on your campus, even if they haven't been able to visit. Oh, that's excellent. And then Justin, uh, what about you? I'd be curious to hear kind of what you did virtually in the fall and any any lessons learned or um, things that you're going to plan to switch up for the spring. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I, I guess the, the first thing for context is that um, we were sort of operating in a, a hybrid mode this fall. Um, we were doing in-person instruction for students that felt comfortable returning to campus. Um, and ultimately, it was about 80% of our new and continuing students that chose to come to campus for in-person instruction. Um, so only about 20% that continued their, their remote learning. Um, and aside from the first two weeks of the semester and the last two weeks of the semester, which we, we kind of called a, a quiet period, the rest of the semester we were also open for in-person visits. And so I think that that was obviously really valuable for students that um, were in our local area that didn't have to travel long distances, that they were able to um, still get that in-person experience. But I think that a, a silver lining to a lot of what has happened this year is it, it really forced us to build out better infrastructure for our, our virtual programming um, and to make sure that students in all different markets were able to still get a taste of Willamette and, and use that in their, their research. So um, we obviously tried to replicate a lot of what the on-campus experience would be in a virtual world, um, whether that be um, virtual tours or um, virtual information sessions, one-on-one -on -one meetings with admission counselors, with faculty, with the financial aid office, um, and with current students. I, I would say that a lot of our build out um, we, there, was, there was a lot of trial and error, really just trying to figure out what mm -hmm. our audience was looking for. But the thing that um, we've gotten the best feedback about has always been that, that interaction with current students. And whether that was panels that we assembled or one-on-one -on -one meetings, um, we really wanted to make sure that we were helping to, to foster those connection opportunities. Um, I would say that also um, in a lot of our, our content development, we really tried to make sure the current students played a direct role in that. Um, our, our virtual tour, for instance, was completely student designed and we have two students that lead the virtual tour so that you, you kind of get to see the, the interaction between them and see a little bit more personality. Mm -hmm. um, as you can imagine, if I were leading a virtual tour, <laughs> everybody, 
please. Like, <laughs> I think that we've, we've heard such great things about having having two students do it and, and being able to be authentic and genuine mm-hmm. and for them to have designed it in a way um, that, you know, they know they know what the audience wants to hear. Um, and then also engaging current students in a lot of our social media content. Um, and again, making sure that it's not just somebody in marketing that's doing it. I, I love our marketing partners, but we wanted we wanted current students to do that because that is the voice that matters most in the search. And I think that's such a like astute thing to be thinking about too, because ultimately, like we as like admission professionals or people who you know have graduated college, what like. I'm not going to say a number, <laughs> um, but like we can sometimes think that we know what students want and we're like, oh, you know, this is what they want. I know that this is what I wanted when I was, you know, looking for colleges. But realistically speaking, like Generation Z is different and they have different priorities and they, I think in a way are like a lot savvier when it comes to mm-hmm. the internet. They like know if you're telling them things that are not true. They're like, I found that on your website and it was a lie. <laughs> it's like, mm-hmm. oh okay, well, you got to be genuine and you have to put your students first at the end of the day too, because they're having the lived experience at your campus. And like, that's super important to have be the voice that's actually talking to prospective students at the end of the day. Yeah, no, that's a, even when I kind of do outreach to folks, they're like, I know that the students don't want to talk to me as much as I have knowledge about the university. They're always like, well, can you put me in touch with someone with a similar major or from the same hometown or whatever it might be. So I think you're you're spot on with that. Um, Justin, since you are kind of lucky enough to have um, students and their families be on campus, what kind of, I'm sure they had um, a lot of questions about safety, things like that. What were top of mind for students um, and the families and how did you address it? Particularly if a student is on a tour, I imagine, and is getting questions like that. Um, yeah, I'm curious to hear how you train the, the students to also be able to address those questions. Yeah, I, I think they knew how seriously we were taking safety the moment we did our screening process before we even let them open their car door. So I mean, they, <laughs> they, they knew that it was not going to be a typical campus visit. And, and um, I mean, from the outset, we, um, we limited the tour slots um, so that we only had one family per tour and a maximum of three guests plus our tour guide, so a maximum of four people. We staggered the tours so that they fell um, during times when our current students were in class so that walking through campus, there wouldn't be a lot of, um, you know, interaction and things like that. So, I mean, just just the planning that went into how we were going to structure it, um, that in itself was a, a huge undertaking. Um, but the only way that we were ever going to feel comfortable um, inviting folks to campus um, I mean, I would say that for those folks that were able to visit, they they felt a lot of reassurance just seeing the the level of detail that we had tried to account for. Um, obviously, explaining to them how we were able to to pull off doing in person instruction. So we shared a lot with them about the new protocols in the residence halls, in the classrooms, in the dining halls, and things like that. So I think that that provided a lot of reassurance. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the main the main thing that comes to mind when you ask that question is it's the students that we've only been able to interact with virtually that are starting to freak out about what spring, like what opportunities will exist for them in the spring to really be able to make that final decision. Cause it's all fun in the fall when, you know, you're jumping from one session to another and you're compiling information about the colleges. But I think it's, it's really going to hit them hard when the time comes to make that choice and to only base it off of virtual content that they've, they've been trying to digest. And so, I think that that's that's the the number one thing on our minds right now is how can we do the right type of yield programming in the spring to to make them feel confident in their their decision process, um, and I, I hope nobody asked me to like give the perfect answer today because I mean <laughs> that's that's where we're at right now is is making sure that we're we're providing the right type of content you know taking the type of things that we would do in our admitted student programming and trying to break it into digestible chunks because obviously we can't ask students to to be in a two-day zoom call with us and so don't do it like on a computer it'll be great (laughs) um anyway i'm sure we'll dive a little bit more into that but i I think that's that's the thing that is uh is keeping me up at nights right now is i'm i'm really really proud of the work that we did in the fall i'm really excited about 
um, a lot of the the different you know metrics um, that we've used to to gauge how successful um, things have been thus far. But none of it will matter if come May one we're we're in a tough spot. Yeah. And this is kind of a departure to a point that you made earlier, but I wanted to just get it in here. Um, I was talking to one of our other CTCL partners who was doing kind of a similar thing to what Willamette's doing in terms of having those like smaller groups and one family at a time on your tours and things like that. And one thing that the partner mentioned that I feel is just important to raise as somebody who used to manage an ambassador program was that she really was super conscious with her ambassadors to kind of empower them to also advocate for themselves in those situations. She said she had a couple of, you know, families that came in and said like, oh, we're outside, we don't need to wear masks, or, you know, if you want to take your mask off, you can. And they had a lot of conversations with their ambassadors about that and about feeling confident to say, you know, no, it's campus policy, like I'm gonna keep my mask on and I would appreciate it if you do the same and like really empowering your current students to advocate for themselves in that way. And so I think that's just another thing that is gonna be even more important as we move into spring with you know potential vaccines and people coming onto campus still should be masked or shouldn't be masked, you know, like depending on how things go. So it's a, it was a good point that she was making. And yeah. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that page. I forgot to add that part. That, that that was definitely a big part of the the preparation for our ambassador team was making sure that they never found themselves having conversations that they weren't comfortable having with our visitors. Um, we did um, kind of institute that uh, when guests are checking in, that a professional staff member is always out in the parking lot with the ambassador. So we do an initial sort of greeting and rundown of protocols. Um, so that the ambassador has support at that time. Um, but then of course, for the, that hour that they're walking around campus, um, we want that ambassador to have the confidence to be able to navigate that process themselves. Um, also our, our tours were only outdoor. I should have added that also. Um, but that was another another protocol that we, we did not go into any buildings because um, as, as much as we're focused on, on protecting visitors to campus and prospective students, we also have that responsibility for our current students. And so it was a very delicate balance to make sure that we were providing a resource to students in their college search without jeopardizing our current student safety in any way. And I'm sure that was fun occasionally in Oregon when it was raining really hard. <laughs> all of those outdoor tours. <laughs> if prospective students can't handle the rain, we shouldn't have been on their list in the first place. You make an excellent point. You make an excellent point. <laughs> uh, that's, um, we actually have a, a question about, I know, Justin, you mentioned being a part of CTCL, it allows you to have a little bit more reach than maybe um, you wouldn't have otherwise. So obviously tons have happened as it relates to international students and their ability to study in the US. And when we talk about students that need reassurance, of course, domestic students, but particularly international students. So we had a question, what have you done particularly for international students within the last few months to create that reassurance? Well, I think like anybody else with our, our international students, they're they're just sort of like waiting to see what what is going to happen and is it going to be okay to travel? Is I mean, obviously the, there's there's more than just the, the pandemic that has affected international numbers at universities all over the, the country in recent years. And so I think that we're we're kind of at, at the threshold of hopefully um, having more open doors for international students to to continue their studies in the US, but there's, there's still kind of that, that sense that we're all in a holding pattern. And so I think we're going to be very flexible with international students on the timeline this year. Um, and the main thing we can do between now and um, the summer is just be, be accessible and just have the conversations. I think that, um, again, we are able to, to provide some reassurance in showing that we had a successful fall semester of in-person instruction. And um, if they're you know looking at schools in the Pacific Northwest, not not everybody can say that. And so mm -hmm. I think that you know, we we set a good tone. There is still a lot that will unfold over the, the spring. Um, but yeah, I I, I don't have like a, a concrete uh, approach necessarily. I just kind of try to meet them where they're at and understand what what fears and anxieties exist and how can we make sure that they feel supported and if that means that they're still kind of in limbo well into the summer 
then then so be it. We're going to be very very flexible with the uh, um, deposit deadlines and things like that for international students because the world in June or July is very different than the world that we're in right now. And mm -hmm. yeah, um, I would say at least also from you know the perspective of other institutions that we work with here at Unibuddy, that's been kind of the overarching theme is that you know we're going to be here for those students and we're gonna do our best to support them any way that we can. And, you know, as much as possible, depending on travel and governments and all sorts of things, like that's that's been a very kind of, I think almost encouraging thing just to hear from people who you would expect to hear it from anyway, but just to say like, yeah, we'll be here for you. We'll wait, we'll be patient, we'll be, you know, flexible, all of those things. It's like, that's good. <laughs> Yeah, and I know you both, you said, like, I don't have the exact answers. I think part of it is just that empathy that you expressed yeah. just now. It's like, hey, I, I know it's an anxious time. I know it's a stressful time, but we're here. Do I have all the answers? No, I feel the uncertainty and the unpredictability of everything the same way you do. But we're going to continue to communicate with you and we're going to be flexible. Um, we're not going to draw a hard line because we know that's impossible right now. So I think that goes so far, even if you don't have answers, because who really does? It's just expressing to them the, the empathy in which things will be approached either way, no matter what way um, things go. I, I think another thing I'll add, just I, I keep looking for silver linings. Um, <laughs> because we aren't doing any international travel this year, it's allowed us to connect in so many new international markets um, virtually because mm -hmm. the conversations we've been having with um, high school counselors and independent consultants all, all over the world um, has it, it's it's been so encouraging and you know time that I'm not spending on an airplane is time that I'm sitting at my desk and I want to use that to build those relationships and and so that I think has been really valuable as we are seeing applications from places that have never sent us apps before and and so I think that that is definitely something to take advantage of at a time like this is do that outreach and um, you know share your product in in places that they may not have that awareness of, of what you can offer. Um, and so anyway, that's that's been, uh, I think, really encouraging this fall. Yeah, it's so much easier to send a link than it is to like put a human on an airplane and like get them to go there, you know, like it's true. That's awesome. <laughs> and I think too, you know, if I really hope that looking forward, folks continue with the blend of in-person and virtual as it relates to recruitment, because going along the lines of what you said, Justin, I really think it increased access and it increased the universities that students can know about. So it works for the, the schools as well. They're reaching markets they you know might have never been able to reach, but then a student who there was no way they were gonna be able to make it to campus, they still can get so much about the campus life that maybe before you'd be lucky if there was like a YouTube tour somewhere that schools have really, really up their game as it relates to virtual. So I'm, I'm hoping that that trend continues even when we're able to, to go back into person. And I think that can be true even domestically too, right? I think about when I was at Willamette, I, I recruited in Texas, which is like such a big state, you know, and I'm like in my little like, like, you know, Ford Camry, just like driving around and trying to get to high schools and things. And like, you know, you make, you make it to as many schools as you can, but when you do have this virtual option, you can send a link to that tiny school in Katy, Texas that I wasn't able to get to just because it was too far off of my, off of my drive from, you know, Dallas to Austin or whatever. And so I think that's something that is a big silver lining from this recruitment cycle. We have that knowledge now and I think we always knew it, but like now you can see it in action, which is good. Yeah, it was it was a huge priority for our team going into this cycle, but before the pandemic, that we wanted to um, do more outreach in rural areas, mm -hmm. and um, so in planning our travel, um, we we had all kinds of new initiatives we were going to do to engage with rural students. And so then when everything shifted virtual, that actually allowed us to reach even more of those students where you know we could we could contact the students directly to engage in conversation because in the in the past if we were doing in-person travel we might have been trying to reach somebody at the school and many of these schools being as under-resourced as they are it, it's you know likely that we could have never even set up a, a typical info session or, mm -hmm. or interview slots with that school um, but by really building our pool and knowing who um, you know who we wanted to give that that uh, that type of outreach to, and in what markets we really wanted to 
focus and, and really tailoring some of our, our programming specifically um, to meet the needs of rural students. That has been another really good, I think, byproduct of, of all of the, the pivots that had to happen this fall. Yeah, totally. Looks like we might have lost Brent for a second, but I'm sure she'll be back. Um, so in the meantime, oh, there she is. Great. Back. She's back. <laughs> I was going to ask Justin to tell us a little bit more about CTCL and good old Lauren Pope. So oh, what do you think, Justin? How's that sound? <laughs> um, sure. Um, so yeah, for folks that, that don't have a, as much familiarity with um, the organization or, or the research that the organization was originally based on, um, Colleges That Change Lives was um, developed, uh, it was, it was a, a book developed by a man named Lauren Pope who um, was really looking at the, the learning outcomes of Ivy League institutions and, and really looking at um, transformational outcomes that could be attained at institutions that were much more accessible than the Ivy League. And so it, it started as this research and eventually turned into a publication that was really meant to guide students and families through the college search with an eye on outcomes more so than name brand and hopefully helping um, you know, students and families uncover some hidden gem institutions that would really change lives, you know, really um, had, had the potential to, to totally change the, the trajectory for a student in their educational pathway, um, but to, to really showcase to them institutions that we're focused on access and, and equity and, and you know, creating opportunity. And so um, the original list of 40 Colleges That Change Lives has expanded to 44. Um, and uh, nice. so, um, it, it, it went beyond just a, a book that, uh, that students could find in their college and career center and, and has developed into an organization that uh, does college programming all over the country. Um, and so uh, if you ever see that a, a CTCL, um, either a, a virtual session or an in-person session is coming to your community, it's definitely something that um, the, the quality of those events is just incredible. Um, and it's something that um, I look forward to every year because the students and the, the families that attend CTCL events are, um, they're, they're just amazing. And uh, okay. yeah. Well, and I'll tell you, that's exactly how my brain got to that question, just because of what you had been talking about with the kind of desire to widen access and make, you know, students potentially an introduction to an institution that they never would have even thought about. And, you know, that was what I always felt like at the CTCL events. It was like the students who came there and would interact with us, it was like, oh my gosh, you all are awesome. <laughs> and like you thought about these, you know, random institutions that maybe wouldn't have been on your list. And it's just like, so great to see that. So you touched on all of the points I wanted you to. You're just like second guess. Yeah. You really followed my logic there. Well, you really put me on the spot. <laughs> you did great. You're like 44, so fantastic. Uh, <laughs> following up on that, I know you talked about um, kind of the CTCL events. I think, you know, I've seen, and it's been nice, um, institutions kind of collaborate and maybe ways that they might not have before, um, just because everyone needs it, right? L lending a hand, um, sharing resources, whatever it might be. Um, talk is has that happened within the CTCL group? How has that been, and what kind of ways have um, you know you've been able to either partner or collaborate or just learn from what other institutions within the group are doing? Yeah, it's it's fantastic whenever we can band together with other CTCL institutions. Um, I mean, I, I think that, you know, just to, to drive student interest where we already know that, that again, we, one of the hallmarks of a lot of the CTCL institutions is we're not necessarily name brand. We're not necessarily something that um, students are, are going to have at the, the front of their mind in their search. And so banding together with a group um, will typically generate just a, a larger audience and, and more curiosity to learn about a range of schools than if just one, you know, if just Willamette is trying to um, do a presentation at a, a high school that hasn't typically been a feeder for us, it can be tough. But if there are five or six of us that are all going to do a session together, um, we have seen huge success with that. And, and that also goes to, um, you know, more specialized events, um, be it uh, like case study programs and things like that. Um, having schools that have similar foundations, similar philosophies, Mm -hmm. um, it, it, we, we can really play off of each other and, um, and, and I think share some unique perspective 
Um, we've done similar things with schools um, regionally. Um, so aside from the collaboration we've done with CTCL schools, we also have uh, a consortium in our region that we call the Northwest Five, um, which is sort of like-minded institutions um, that are all small private liberal arts in the Pacific Northwest. And so whenever we can collaborate with those folks, that's also been fantastic. So I, I do think that that has been a, a cool shift um, that we've seen, um, and I'm sure any number of people that are on various listservs, you, 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 you see all of these different sort of group presentations that are happening, but I think that that's such a fantastic resource for students. Um, and so it, it also can be then more, more hopefully tailored to their, their interests because you can find institutions grouping together that are maybe um, pre presenting on a, a more focused topic um, rather than just general information. Well, I feel like that kind of helps with Zoom fatigue at the end of the day too, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, everybody is being asked to jump on all of these different webinars or information sessions that are virtual or in person or like, you know, all over the place. And if you can really come together mm -hmm. and offer a useful package deal for those students that are already interested in one institution, you can like really open some doors that maybe would not have been opened in the first place, which is always good. <laughs> Definitely. And I know we talked earlier a little bit, we hit on the metrics piece. And obviously, you know, this, this year, everyone was just trying a bunch of stuff, seeing what would work and learning lessons along the way. Um, so I'm curious both to Paige with, with the parties we work with and Justin as well. Um, when you look at the kind of year in review, were you taking a look at you know, all right, these types of programs were the most successful, were you getting nitty gritty, like to the time and the types of student populations? What did that, the, the kind of metrics look like um, and, and that data and how do you plan to use that in the spring to make the spring even better than the fall was? That's a very good question, I would say. And it really, honestly, from our partner institutions at Unibuddy, it came down to like a large variety of different things were successful based on really the institutions that we're working with. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I always tell my partners to really lean into is, you know what your strengths are as an institution, right? Especially for CTCL schools. This Your strength is that you are like super personal, individualized. You have all of these like fantastic things that you can offer to your students. So if you can only do that virtually, do that virtually. And, you know, try and put as many students in front of these prospective students as possible because you would do that when you're on campus, right? If you generally do like, a fun trivia night for part of your like preview day. Do that on, you know, WhatsApp or Quizlet or whatever you can, you know, like at the end of the day, try and take those strengths that you have physically and make them virtual. And don't really try and like subscribe yourself to this idea like we have to do the event on Saturday <laughs> at 8 a.m. because that's when we do it, you know, in person and we'll do it from eight to five and that'll be fine. It's like maybe try a Wednesday night from like five to six p.m. because maybe that's when your students are done with homework and can hop on to a webinar with you or give a Sunday like midday a try, you know, like as much as possible, just try to be flexible with the full recognition that like you are human beings too. So you need to take time for yourself to be like mentally sound because that's a <laughs> big thing at the end of the day. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, I think, um, Josh, the, obviously the, the, the content, depending on, on the time of year and where students are out of the process, um, it evolves. And because all of, almost all of our, our yield programming in the spring um, had to shift to virtual, um, and now we're going into the, the second spring, we're able to really refine that content more um, and, and learn from what worked and what didn't work last year. I think that um, the, the key things, we, we want students to talk to students, we want students to talk to faculty, and we want prospective students to talk to each other. Um, and so creating both formal and informal settings and, and keeping the, the time commitment digestible. Mm -hmm. um, are really key as well. That again, we can't we can't have the the same um, amount of focus that would have happened in a, a two day overnight event. Mm -hmm. But if we can have that content in smaller chunks and offer it at different times, um, that is really the the key. Um, and you know, as as has been mentioned, you know, sometimes um, you 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 post 
a bunch of different sessions and, and you think that everyone's going to gravitate towards one that you think is the ideal time slot and you find mm -hmm. that some other time slot is actually the one that, that meets capacity and it's your um you know the the, the saturday afternoon that you thought was going to be popular that nobody wants to give up their saturday for that and so i'm, like, I'm busy <laughs> I'm, busy like a lot. Like, I'm not into that <laughs> yeah and, and and so i mean there we're definitely um you know having more um series or, or re repeating events so that students can um choose that that content when it fits their schedule um gosh i'm, I'm trying to think of other things because so much there's so much planning that we we're, we're we're still you know really compiling information from this last year in preparation for the spring um you might have to come back to me as as some additional details come to mind well and i think one thing that you mentioned that is has been universally important with all of our partners and like it's kind of part of unibuddy's mission at a baseline is having those students talk to your current students like that has always been a selling point like we know when you come to an institution and you make a connection with a student ambassador with a tour guide with you know the person at the bistro who gave you your coffee like <laughs> any of those things like are going to be a real moment where a prospective student feels a connection and feels like oh yeah like i can make friends here like i can exist here really well and one thing that we see from the chats specifically, like one of my partner institutions emailed me the other day and they were like, I just keep seeing people on Unibuddy coming in and saying like, can we be friends when I come here? <laughs> I wanna hang out with you. And like, I think that type of interaction is what you want at the end of the day. You want those connections to be made. You want people to feel like they have a place at your institution. And the only way they're gonna do that is if they're able to talk to your, talk to your students. Can I yeah, yeah. <laughs> just just trying to increase our, our accessibility to current students has has been big. Um, even our, our virtual high school visits and virtual info, info sessions and things like that, which are normally just led by one of our admission counselors, we've made sure that current students are a part of those sessions. Um, and there's some content that they deliver, but otherwise they're just available there to share perspective when it's appropriate. Um, and then even with, I would say, uh, kind of an anticipated shift in timeline with applications and knowing that there are gonna be more mm -hmm. students in this cycle applying regular decision, um, um, which I, I think that a, a lot of schools are, are seeing, um, but certainly we are seeing that our, our RD numbers are, are up and our EA numbers are pretty flat. Mm -hmm. um, so we are taking a lot of our, our app development content that normally we would be sort of at the tail end of, but really trying to extend it into January and February um, so that, again, it's all about meeting students where they're at and knowing that there are conditions present this year that we've, we've never had to deal with before. And so me, even making sure that current students are involved in some of the, the app gen um, programming that we do. Um, we, we just we want if we, anytime we can have a current student in that 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 room in that virtual room with us um that is just one more touch point that we want the prospective students to have um i see that there was a, a question about engaging with parents and this was something i forgot to mention earlier but that, that a lot of our content development right now too is is trying to make sure that we have the appropriate information for parents mm -hmm. and you know that's always a, a big part of our our on-campus programming is there's there's sessions that are for everybody, but then there are sessions where we want to break the students away from the parents because mm -hmm. we know that there's there's different information that they're trying to gather, and and the way that they process that information is different when they are separated from one another. And so, trying to make sure that we recreate that virtually as well and have the right information specific to parents, um, and and also to um, you know our our partners on the the high school side, um, mm -hmm. knowing that prospective students are gonna be very reliant on the resources in their communities. Um, we wanna make sure that they're very informed about just all of the, the nuance and, and different things that uh, are gonna be faced this year. And so, um, yeah, basically if I'm not eating or sleeping, I'm on Zoom, um, <laughs> one way or another, um, you know, just sort of making sure that we have the right message going to the right audience. Well, and I think the point that you make about um, high schools and high school counselors is a really astute one as well, because at the end of the day, too, there are a vast variety of different high school situations happening right now, too. So, you know, students have potentially less access to their counselors, you know, mm -hmm. maybe folks within 
like early access programs may not have as much, you know, time to chat with folks about their like actual applications. So I think, you know, as people who are either external readers for universities or reading applications at a baseline, that's something that we need to be really conscious of in this season and like, you know, maybe ask for a few more augmented reviews or a few more like, you know, additional counselor calls, which is like such a burden on the counselors, but will hopefully at the end of the day help their students too. So that's definitely something to keep in mind. Paige, I'm wondering, did, do we know of any of our partners that have, I know Justin talked about the parents, um, created specific kind of any virtual programming for students, um, but also their families on the side of that? You know, that's such a good question. And actually, I cannot think of any of my partner institutions who've like done that in the recruitment side of things. But I do know that there are a few partner institutions that I work with who are very interested in doing that on the like after admission type of things, you know, really trying to ensure that, you know, the parents feel like their students are going are going to have a space at the university and be safe and be protected, you know, all of the things that they want to know in a regular year, but it's just like heightened by 2020 and the situations that we're all in. So I do think we'll see more of that as as the kind of yield season progresses. Yeah, definitely resonated with Jessu and, um, you know, working in orientation be like, all right, so here's the, you know, public and safety talk we're going to give to the parents. And here's what we're going to give to you all, because you need a very intense, different kind of session going on right here. So I think that's no, I think that's important to make sure that you're even considering the audience as it relates to students and their families when they're, you know, learning a little bit more about the university. Um, I also, oh, sorry, I thought Paige, you're going to say something. Nope, go ahead. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, not to, uh, you know, skip ahead a little bit, but I know that we talked and we'll talk even more about the spring, but in terms of the the summer months and what those might or might not look like, um, plans on kind of keeping the student engaged as it relates to um, summer melt and, you know, how the uncertainty might continue, right, throughout those summer months as well. Um, and I'm sure you're all thinking ahead that way, Justin, at Willamette in terms of contingency plans, because you kind of have to these days. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, one of the, the things that, um, you know, be, because of the timing of everything last year, uh, a lot of our, our yield programming in the spring, um, it, it just ended up spilling into the summer. Um, it was, you know, sort of yield yield never stopped last year. Um, and and so the, you know, we were so fortunate to have a lot of faculty step up and um, be available to, to interact with students. Um, they did a lot of um, mock classes and then we even did, um, we offered three sections of a, a, a four, a, an actual four credit class where students could um, kind of get a, a jump start on their first year by enrolling in a, an early class, and and so I think that the it's it's a fine line between you know when they want to engage with their peers and think about all the exciting stuff that is going to start happening in August. And then when they are, are really getting more in the academic mindset and they want to have that engagement with professors. Um, and so, yeah, it, I mean, it's, it's a lot of the same stuff that we've talked about with yield in, in that um, we, it's, a, it's all hands on deck. I mean, we, we want our current students involved. We want faculty involved. Um, we want to, to really make sure that we're, we're conscious of what the student, the prospective student is looking for. And so, um, you know, some of it we're, we're sort of planning on the planning on the fly based on demand. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I do know that, that looking ahead, we will once again have academic components, um, both in terms of just faculty availability for um, Q&A, but also mock classes and things like that. Um, and then just continuing to find different forums where prospective students and current students can interact and where prospective students can connect with their, their fellow prospective students and hopefully start to build that community um, and that, that affinity with Willamette. Um, because yeah, um, there, there is no end to yield season until, <laughs> until the fall semester begins and we actually have butts and seats and we know that, uh, that, that that class is getting off to the start that, that we're all hoping for. Yeah, I really love the idea of doing like mock classes. I know. That's like such a fun way to keep students engaged because they don't want to hear any more like presentations on mm -hmm. 
you know, boring stuff. Right. Basically, we want to talk to anybody other than our staff. <laughs> we hear so much from our staff, and it's just it's trying to make sure that they have that that engagement with all of the people that will be a part of their four year experience. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we want them. We want them to have that interaction with folks in student affairs. We want them to have that interaction. Um, if they're a student athlete, we want them to have that interaction with, um, you know, future teammates and coaches. And so it's it's just going to be all about creating that that virtual environment where those types of things can can happen and those relationships can really start to form. Yeah, and I was thinking like when you would go, you know, on campus, potentially you could sit in on a classroom. So that's a good way to have the mock class for them to get the academic experience side of it um, to understand how that works. Uh, Paige, I am curious in terms of, you know, any of our partners. Um, I think Justin is lucky that the faculty are willing to do those things. I think you can be at an institution where um, maybe that's not the case, or even the relationship between the admissions team and the academic side, um, whether it's a large institute or however the school is organizationally set up, um, yeah. you're not able to do that. So um, have our partners, you know, maybe in that realm been able to get faculty to be involved and what type of involvement do the faculty end up having? Yeah, that's such a good question. And I think, you know, having worked at a large institution myself, you do kind of get to know the faculty members who are maybe more willing to participate in things like this. And I think this is the moment to really call on those faculty members and say, you know, you're our superstars in the first place, but like, do you think you could pull together like even a quick 15 minute mock lecture or like a 10 minute mock lecture just to give students an idea, just give them a little taste of what it would be like to be in your classroom. And if you don't have that type of superstar faculty member, well then what I would recommend is like leaning on your current students again and maybe having them talk about like their favorite class that they've taken and give a kind of description of what that looked like. Or if you work at a research institution, like have your students talk about the research that they do with faculty members. There's a lot of cool ways that you can kind of kind of involve the faculty without fully involving them almost um, at, at by leading on your current students. So those would be my recommendations. If. <laughs> if I was asked. <laughs> I think students always have a lot more leverage too. If they went yeah. to their, like, hey, you're my favorite professor. Cool. I am doing this like Q&A. Would you mind just talking 20 minutes about X topic that we covered in class? I think it'd be really cool. So okay. they lean in on them and getting them to, cause you know, it'll go a lot farther than when, when we actually say yeah, it. Yeah, when you like email them like, hi, can you help me again? Can you help me please? <laughs> um, <laughs> I know some things, you know, obviously takes a lot of planning and folks might not even, you know, be in a place where when they can do these bigger, larger projects. I think a lot of people are in the go, putting out the nearest, figuring out the next thing. So both Paige and Justin, any quick wins that universities can do um, to create that sense of belonging from afar um, that might be helpful that, you know, do, doesn't have to be a heavy lift for them, but something that is a, is a quicker win or a quicker tweak that they can do to help them do that. I can start. So, cause I just had an idea pop into my head and I promise that I'm not a broken record when I say to lean on students, but I think if you have a marketing and communications department that is willing to kind of loosen the reins on your Instagram or your Twitter, allowing your students to take control of that because they are the folks who exist really well in those social media spaces um, and allowing them to kind of put their authentic voice into your social media. It's a really, really effective way to kind of put your students front and forward and allow them to do what they do best and talk about your institution and connect with students in that way. <sighs> Hopefully not too big of a lift, but I know sometimes that can be a little complicated in and of itself. <laughs> yeah, I feel like we've we've talked so much about the, the accessibility of current students. I, I guess another thing that comes to mind is um, using every opportunity to build memorable moments and and celebrate with the the perspective and, and incoming students so if it's rethinking the the way that you notify them of their admission or if it's a gift that they receive when they deposit or um it's just it, making those things a big deal because again when when they are physically on campus and they can celebrate with their their peers and um, and with current students and things like that, 
that means the world to them. And so how can you create those moments, um, you know, in, in this, in this world? Um, I don't want to give away any, any, uh, secrets here, but I, <laughs> that's what we're here, Justin, <laughs> one secret, one secret for us, please. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I, I would say that, you know, it, engaging um you know whether you do a lot of your your marketing communication in-house or you have a, a team that you can rely on for that obviously it, that's difficult to to build that stuff out midstream um but uh you know in the in the last year um pre pre-covid but one thing that we wanted to do to really celebrate our um our admitted students is rather than just sending them a, a letter that you know was in a a nice you know foil template and a folder and everything to, to jazz it up a little bit, we now, we send them a, a scarf. And so Aww. they get a Willamette branded scarf and we hope that they then share pictures with that scarf on social media. And mm -hmm. so we see then, you know, all of this um, class of 20, 24, 25, whatever, whatever they are, you know, like they, they've, they've got all their hashtags and stuff. See, and this, this is why we have current students do social media and not me. Uh, <laughs> But, it, but they, that, that's already starting to, to build community with the, the prospective students because they're already starting to identify with their peers that have gotten the same good news that they've gotten. And they, they have a memento rather than just a, a letter that, that yeah. came in an envelope. Um, and, and yeah, so anyway, I would say that things like that that you can do um, to, to build that enthusiasm, um, this is the time. This is absolutely the time to do it. I love that. Celebrate the big moments because that is a big moment, right? Um, and I think going, I even see someone put that a school ask about pets on the application and they sent an admissions letter to the pet as well. So just <laughs> little things that you can do to just help them feel like we're super excited for you to come to campus and we're super excited that you're part of this community goes a, goes a long way. Uh, we had a question about stealth applicants and how do you try to engage um, with those students considering they're not necessarily, you know, filling out any inquiry forms. So how do you kind of continue to do similar things that you're doing for prospective students with those applicants particularly? Gosh. Um, <laughs> I have a... <laughs> It's a tough question, I think, just because like those students by in like the nature of the way that they appear in your funnel, it's like, oh, you're here now. That's great. Like, how did you find out about us? How did you get here? Um, and so I would say like at least to kind of help Justin think a little bit, too. I mean, like, you know, if you have a great CRM like like Slate, hopefully you would notice that like the application is their first interaction. And maybe then you reach out to them and say like, hey, you know, we're so excited that you're here, but how did you find out about us? So that you could kind of dig into that stealthy side of things and say like, where did you come from? Why are you here? We're glad you're here, but why are you here? <laughs> and kind of like figure out where you should maybe be directing some attention in the future too, and utilizing that information a little bit. but. I yeah, I, I can see that we're we're a lot more intentional this year in um, in our Common App and asking how students learned about Willamette mm -hmm. um, because we have expanded our um, our digital marketing so much, and so um, it's going to be really interesting to sort of track um, how effective that has been. Um, you know, we're uh, you know at the point that doing um, social media marketing, um, you know, based off of um, geofencing that we're doing in. Um, certain markets and doing Spotify ads and things like that. And so it's going to be really interesting to see how that has increased um, students' awareness of Willamette in, in key markets. I would say that one of the um, biggest feeders of, of stealth applicants that um, we are being more consistent in tracking now has, has been athletics. Um, mm. And that um, we don't necessarily know about the coaches' interactions and so we see that that, um, that origin of the student record is the application. Well, we are um, definitely doing more data tracking and really making sure that the information from the athletic CRM is being fed into Slate in a way that we can better use, um, use that data. And so we can also then use that in future projections and understand the behavior of a student athlete in the funnel compared to um, other students in the funnel and understand how that, that coach interaction or that team interaction influences their behavior um, throughout the cycle. And so um, 
<laughs> there, there are so many times where that, that application um, pops up and you wonder how the heck did they find us? <laughs> if, you, if you dig deep enough, you can you can find um, that it was it was a coach, and and that's definitely something that we want to celebrate as well is the the yeah. visibility that our athletic teams give us um, to to help drive applications. So that's a big piece. But otherwise, I think that a year from now we're going to be much better positioned to understand um, how this digital world has changed our visibility um, and. Um, adapt accordingly. So what I'm hearing is we do this again a year from now. And then See, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that works. And I, I know that wasn't the question, but that example, Justin, um, whether or not it could be a quick one is a good example of collaboration, right? So athletics is doing their own um, different type of recruiting and working with them to be like, they actually talked to a coach. They came to, you know, um, See, we came to see them play at this certain tournament or whatever, and these are the different touch points they've actually had. I think that's a great example of how to work a little bit smarter with the data and collaborate in ways maybe that you wouldn't think automatically to collaborate. Yeah, yeah, and a, a, a kind of a step that we're taking forward with that too is um, in over the last several years, athletics has operated out of their own CRM and they run their own communication campaigns and things like that. And so um, we've made sure that there's a lot more collaboration just in building out their comms workflows and, and understanding that we want their message to um, really work well in tandem with our message. Um, mm -hmm. Because in the past, we didn't necessarily know what information they were receiving from athletics. And the whole thing was very jumbled up for a long time, but we're, we're, we're making so much, so much progress in the way that we communicate and, and making sure that that communication is appropriate at different stages in the funnel. Um, but also um, we're piloting with two teams giving them um, added access in Slate so that they can directly put interactions on the student timeline. Awesome. And so that is gonna be really helpful for us because that's one piece that is missing from um, what being reliant on the data exchange between the two CRMs. Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily see those individual touch points. We just know that they are in communication with a coach, but now having two different teams that can go in and add those interactions in Slate, we'll really be able to look at that influence over the, the recruits, um, process through the cycle um, and hopefully be able to uh, eventually eliminate that athletic CRM and just get everybody into Slate because that would be the, the ideal thing. So we definitely have to be in a year because I want to know how this this goes. I'm the part <laughs> so two coming. Like, that's that's part happen. two. <laughs> oh, man. Well, thank you so much, uh, Paige, Justin. Really appreciate it. I learned a bunch, including that Willamette is the oldest institution in the West, but other great ideas I'm excited to, to share with our future partners in terms of some of the exciting stuff that you're doing and even you, Paige, learning a little bit more about what our current partners are doing. So really appreciate you both joining and for folks that are watching. Um, thanks for coming to, to chat with us. Yeah, thanks for having us. <laughs> Bye.